Hey y'all, welcome back to the Fire and Water Cooking Podcast. I'm Darren, I'm your host. Today I got another great guest, Mr. Nick Parsons, the VP of Marketing for Hasty Bake Grills. I can't wait to talk to Nick about Hasty Bake. They've been around since 1948 in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and they make one of the best grills I've ever seen. I'll be right back with Nick Parsons. Smoking, grilling, getting hot and hotter. Hey all, I want to welcome back Inkbird Products as a sponsor of the Fire and Water Cooking Podcast. Inkbird makes some great thermometers, Wi-Fi, uh, Bluetooth, all that. But they also make a great instant read thermometer that I really love. It's waterproof, totally rechargeable with USB, very accurate. Everybody should have one of these in their kitchen so they can check the internal temperatures of their food so they don't end up overcooking. Check out the waterproof instant read thermometer below and a link to Amazon from Inkbird. Welcome back, Inkbird Products. Welcome back to the Fire and Water Cooking Podcast. I'm Darren. I'm your host, of course. And today, I've got another great guest, Mr. Nick Parsons. He is the Vice President of Marketing for Hasty Bake Charcoal Grills out of Tulsa, Oklahoma. And uh, they've been around since 1948. They're a really great uh, grill company. Uh, actually, I just got one, but I want to introduce Nick so he can tell us all about Hasty Bake Grills. Hey, guys. Thanks for having us on, Darren. Appreciate you. Um, love what you guys are doing here. I think you guys got a, a really cool following of people who love what you're doing, so we're excited to uh, beyond. I'm excited that uh, you've recently become a Hasty Baker too, so you're familiar with kind of what we do and uh, and the quality and everything. So yeah, that's me. So I'm, uh, I'm the VP of Marketing and Ops here uh, at Hasty Bake. I uh, have been working with them for about the last five years, been on full-time staff with them for only about the last six months, uh, but was an ambassador uh, with them for quite a while. Uh, did a bunch of um, you know, kind of outside events, cooking events, a lot of teaching classes, uh, a lot of trainings, a lot of 101 type of things, uh, did a lot of video content for them. And eventually they just said, everything you've been doing for us, we want you to do full time so we don't have to keep pulling you away from your day job. <laughs> so uh, that's kind of how we how we landed there. So we run all the marketing. Uh, so anything you see social, myself and my team does. Uh, all the video stuff, you're going to see my ugly mug on YouTube and on Facebook and things like that all the time. Uh, and then uh, the day-to-day -day operations. So not only do we have a plant that's right here behind me that does uh, all the everything from taking the sheet steel to bending, breaking, welding, assembling, uh, all here. Uh, we also have a retail operation. Uh, so I oversee the operations for all that. So you started out personally in the competition barbecue, correct? Or is that how yeah, you got involved correct. in it? Yeah, so I ran KCBS Trail for quite a while. Uh, did a bunch of stuff with the SCA. Uh, did IBCA um, and eventually went from gigantic trailer smokers down to falling in love with Hasty Bakes and competing on uh, four of those on the back of a trailer for a while uh, and and kind of went that route. Uh, they became my favorite cooker in the backyard and just kind of everything else. I got I got 28 cookers sitting in the backyard and the one that gets the most use is always going to be that Hasty Bake. Now are you originally from the Tulsa area or? Uh, no, so uh, my family is originally from Texas. I spent a lot of time out in California, moved back to Tulsa about 12 years ago, uh, and uh, and actually hadn't even heard of Hasty Bake until I moved back to Tulsa. Uh, so uh, immediately when I when I started seeing people cook on them, I had to you know kind of say, what is this phenomenon that everyone around here is in love with? Because uh, truthfully, you know, you get too far out of Oklahoma, uh, and up until now, the people hadn't heard of us. So. Uh, you come back into Tulsa and every backyard in town has one in it and everyone's got a story of their grandfather or their dad cooking on it. So uh, that, that's kind of was my introduction was coming back to town and, and realizing it was a thing. Yeah, and that's one of the things I want to talk about. Hasty Bake, uh, you know, a brief history. I'm going to go ahead and pull up the website too because how I found out about them was I, I stumbled across them on the um, – on the amazingribs.com's website and actually um, Meathead Goldwyn is one of his favorite grills that uh, he, he loves. He's got a, I guess a pro and a gourmet and he's got, yep. uh, he's got uh, platinum reviews on both of those grills. And I, I looked at that grill and I said, I've never seen this type of grill before. I'm, I've 
it looks amazing to me the, the way that you can adjust the charcoal uh, you know uh, the, the, the charcoal up and down to sear and smoke and just the overall design of the grill and then I was you know stunned to, to see it. it's been around since 1948 with the design you know not very many changes to it and right. I was kind of stunned that it hadn't been out there you know it's not you can't find it everywhere it's it's you know stayed around I guess you know it, it kind of goes outside of the Oklahoma area but it stayed pretty much around that market for a long time and I guess one of the reasons is that it's still made in the uh, USA and the plant is right there in Tulsa. It's not, you know, a mass market grill that's, you know, done outside of, you know, in China or some other place, but um, it's pretty much, you know, 100% made in the USA. So how, how important is that to the Hasty Bake Company? Uh, it's one of our uh, kind of our founding uh, foundations. One of our building blocks has always been uh, we will and always be an American made company, uh, American employed company. Uh, we don't outsource parts. We don't outsource uh, anything to, to China or Europe or any other, you know, location. Everything is here. So if you were to walk the plant with me in the back, uh, you're going to see sheet steel being delivered and it's going to be it's going to be bent, it's going to be broke, it's going to be uh, cut and, and spot welded and pop riveted and everything else that goes into it and assembled in box right here um, uh, by people that live here in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And that's always been a foundation of our company uh, and always will be a foundation of our company. We don't pull, you know, massive parts in from China or even buy steel from China or, or any other country. It's, it's always been American made steel. Uh, and, and truthfully, uh, a little bit probably to our detriment, you know, they, they're bigger companies that are out there that, you know, decided decades ago, hey, we're going to go ahead and, and, you know, ship stuff out to foreign countries. Uh, they, they might be able to service, you know, Home Depot and Lowe's and Walmart and, you know, get 20 or 30,000 units in a quarter and, and sell them. And we've said, that's just not who we want to be. We don't want to be a company that, uh, you know, I'm sure the money's great, but we don't want to be a company that moves in those kind of units because of the sacrifices you have to make. Uh, to be able to operate at that scale. So we're, we're still, we bill ourselves really and, and truly are a handmade grill. If I walk you back to our assemblies, you're going to see those guys uh, tweaking and welding and, and hammering away on these things. And uh, that, that's what we love about ourselves is just uh, keeping it here, keeping it on the home front. So give me a brief history of Hasty Bake. Yeah, so uh, in 1948, uh, our founder, Grant Hastings, uh, eventually with, uh, with his partner, uh, Baker, who Hasty Bake is kind of the names there, uh, they uh, came back from the war and Grant basically said, uh, I, I want to be able to cook ribs in my backyard as good as my favorite barbecue restaurant and without having to go to the barbecue restaurant. So they looked at the, uh, the style that most people were cooking on at the time, which is kind of the big uh, block pit cookers. And they said, what if we could do something like that in our backyard? And at the time in 1948, uh, there, there were backyard grills, but a backyard grill back in 1948 was basically uh, a bucket that you could pour coal into that had some legs on it. Uh, it didn't have a hood. It didn't have wheels. It wasn't this highly designed product. It was uh, basically what we would call kind of an asado grill uh, these days uh, or like a catering grill. Uh, so you'd kind of throw that grate back on it after you got your heart, your charcoal hot and that's what you cook on. So definitely you can't produce the same kind of quality product that you would at say a barbecue restaurant uh, or even truly smoke on it. So he said, I want to be able to do that. So uh, they started designing a cooker that would be able to create convection smoke and convection heat. And you could do a long, a long smoke and truly cook barbecue on it. Uh, and then once they got that that prototype down, they said, we want this thing to be portable enough that I can cook it in my backyard or I can bring it to a neighbor's house or uh, I can do something with that. So they threw wheels on it. And, and in the process of doing this and saying, we're going to create a better, more usable backyard experience for people, they were the first ones to do it. So if you look at the trademarks uh, from back in that time, we were the first one to put a hood on a grill. Uh, we are, you know, uh, literally the lid on a grill didn't exist before we did it. Uh, putting wheels on a grill didn't exist, you know, before we did it. So if you look at the trademarks that even Weber or PK or any of the other grill companies that kind of came along uh, over the next 10 or 15 or 20 years after we did, uh, their patents all referenced uh, Grant Hastings' original patent. So when they decided they wanted to put a hood on their grill, they had to use uh, the reference to us for being where that came from. So that was kind of the foundation was we were the first ones to do it. And over time, 
realized that there was something to this convection cooking. There was something to this, this moving smoke over, and it wasn't just like an offset like we know it today where you, you take your heat and you draw it across and you export it. Like it, it's something with being able to kind of get that smoke and that heat to, to rotate. So they started messing around with different hood designs and different uh, angles to move things and, and different ways to move the heat. And, and essentially what they settled on was a hood that was angled to catch the smoke that comes in and circulate it effectively and be able to control the heat almost like you would with a gas grill. So, you know, we know on a gas grill, you, you take that knob and you turn it from low, medium, high, and that's how you control your heat. You can't do that on a charcoal grill. So what they came up with was a lift mechanism that you could turn a crank and you can move that fire away from the meat in different, you know, variances to create a low, medium, or high heat uh, in that grill. So they made this thing as versatile as possible. So what you know is versatility with a gas grill or a pellet grill or something those days, we, it's basically a manual version of that versatility. And we've made little tweaks here and there, but uh, as soon as we kind of settled on that lift mechanism and that hood design that creates that convection, every model we've released thereafter has used that same design uh, you know, to different levels to, you know, you can add more food to this or you can get more smoke on that or you can cook you know, large side or small side or whatever, but it all is going to use that same uh, versatility that, that Grant Hastings founded back in 1948. Well, and that's another thing I want to talk about too. And another thing that's unique to the, um, to the hasty bake is the ventless hood. There is no vents mm -hmm. in the hood, even in, even in the uh, gourmet, which I have as the, the larger hood, it has holes for the rotisserie, but the vents themselves are on the top section on, on the, opposite side of where the lower vents are you know the lower vents yep. go, go right up against um the firebox you know here and you can see it on the door here in the uh, uh uh the website here you can see where the vent is on the lower side but the vent on the opposite side is up top kind of just under where the grate is so i mean it not being in the hood allows that smoke like you said to go up top and then circulate inside the hood and then go out the other side. Yep. So you'll, it, it's become kind of popular over, you know, the last handful of years. Convection cooking is nothing new. But uh, if you look at, you know, a, a cheap smoker that you're going to go get at Walmart. So, you know, maybe you want to spend 150 bucks. Uh, you're going to have a firebox on one side and you're going to have this smokestack that comes out of the hood and it's built into the hood. And it essentially takes all the heat that rises and sucks all the smoke and all the heat right out the hood. Well, what you've done is created a linear line from your fire directly where that thing is exiting. Uh, in order to achieve convection, what a lot of smoker builders are doing now is they're taking that exhaust vent and they're making it lower than the grate level to try to get that smoke and that heat to spin through the chamber and then exit below the grate so it's creating kind of that circular motion. Uh, we were the first ones to do that in a backyard grill model. So that smoke and that heat does rise. It hits the hood. It spins off the, the diagonal pattern of the hood. And as it falls and rotates under your meat, it exits back below the meat. So we, we really do get that true convection. The benefits of that are you don't have to move your meat around and you don't have hot spots. Uh, you get phenomenal color because you're able to kind of get that roasting color from the heat, the smoke bouncing off the hood uh, and you get a really, really good even controlled heat uh, because you don't have this heat that's just bouncing in every direction on it and, and you know, trying to exit right at one spot because anyone who knows who's a cooked on an offset cooker is your hottest spots on that cooker are right where the fire is and right where the air, you know, exits because it's moving so fast. So we really allow that smoke and that heat to slow down and circle in that chamber, uh, which creates color and a flavor and a hasty bake that you don't get in a lot of other grills. How similar is that to uh, reverse flow in the uh, offsets? So you start to get it uh, in a reverse flow. The problem with a reverse flow is that you have to have a hard enough draft to pull that smoke and that heat all the way through the chamber, make the turn, and then draft it all the way back out. Um, so in a, in a appropriately and, and properly designed reverse flow, you're going to get a really good convection heat. Uh, a lot of times what happens is people just throw a bottom plate on an offset cooker uh, and don't pay any attention to really the square inches that you need in your heating your smoke. So you end up either with stale smoke or you end up with a draft that's so hard that it kind of creates like a jet engine 
uh, and you don't actually get that true circulation. So it, it comes down to making sure your air is coming in at the right rate and then spinning at the right rate and exiting at the right rate that you can keep uh, that smoke and that heat in that chamber long enough to kind of you know achieve the effect that you're you're trying to go for. So a, a cheap reverse flow, there's no comparison. A properly de designed reverse flow, that's when you really start getting convection heat and offset growth. Gotcha. What um, what was the original the original design? Is it closer to the legacy model? Um, yep. It's on the website here. Yeah. So that's pretty. Yeah, the leg and that's why we call it the legacy um, because it's kind of it is our legacy. It's the original model. Uh, it, it was back then. It was called the Country Clubber, uh, and then we it moved into uh, I think we called it a Boomer for a while. Um, reference to Oklahoma there, and then eventually became the legacy. Uh, so we, we've had several, but the original style that he came up with was what was that legacy. Now, originally the diagonal of the hood uh, was was swapped. So instead of kind of leaning in on the left and the right, it leaned in on the front on the back. Uh, they actually even made a, uh, a more accentuated version of it that we now call a coffin top uh, that kind of tried to capture that smoke in a roundish type capsule. Uh, but we really realized if you're pulling the smoke in from the side of the cooker, you want it to bounce off that left inside wall and kind of follow those diagonals and smoke and then exit on the left hand side and that's going to get your your most appropriate amount of speed and smoke so they experimented i mean the people will find that the hasty bait collectors that we have which we do have them uh they grab stuff from every corner of the country and you'll find models that have vents on the front or vents on the back or a different shaped hood or uh, all these little things that they've tried and what would happen was they build a prototype they play around with it uh, they either put it to the side or give it to a friend and that friend would sell it to somebody and and they kind of made their way all over the country. Uh, so with all these different models, but what we have now is is kind of the final model they settled on. Uh, and that's that is the legacy. And then later on down the line, we added uh, a taller, taller walls to the top part of it. And uh, that's kind of where we get the gourmet model. We, we had one we called the Dixie Bell and a couple other models that uh, started getting fixed walls on in the hood and you just open basically a bifold door on the front. Uh, and that model really allows you to uh, take advantage of rotisserie, which I know is kind of something you'd like to do. Uh, and a lot of our people that are just addicted to doing rotisserie, they love that gourmet model. And the reason being is because you have instant access to your meat right there in front of you. When we developed that model, uh, which I believe was probably back in the late 60s, early 70s. Rotissing was something that was new to the market that people absolutely fell in love with, and it was a brand new experience. Um, so that's kind of where it came from, and it's still a very popular way to cook these days. You can do a rotisserie in a legacy model, uh, but your rotisserie bar ends up being basically at great height. You pull your grates out and slide the rotisserie bar in uh, at great height, and then you have to keep your firebox in the bottom in the smoke position. Uh, to, to kind of create enough distance from the, from the meat to, and the heat. When you move up to the gourmet model, which is what you're showing right here, you can kind of see that little flap near the top of the hood. Those flaps open up and your bar goes there and you really have access to be able to take your fire from the very bottom position all the way to the very top position uh, and really take advantage of it. You could actually, if you wanted to, pull the grates out and run two rotisses on it uh, at the bottom level where you would on the legacy and at the top level where you do on the gourmet. Uh, and some people do that, but for rotisserie, that's really the, the benefit of the gourmet. You also get a warming rack uh, on the inside of the gourmet uh, that goes the full width of the grill. So it gives you about a third more cooking space. Uh, we sell an extender that goes on the legacy that gives you a little bit extra cooking space on the legacy, but that gourmet really is, is made to load that thing up in any way you can, whether it be a rotisserie or extra stuff on the warming rack or whatever. I'm surprised because with all the um, technology and the new designs and grills that have been coming out in the last 10 or 12 years to look at this, you know, not knowing the whole history, if I were to look at this, you know, just somebody just pulled this up on Amazon, I would think this was a recently designed grill with all the innovation that's in it. And the, to tell me that it's been around since 1948 just really blows my mind. I still, I'm starting to see now some grills, you know, the cheaper, you know, Alibaba, you know, char grillers, Royal yep. Gourmets are starting to use the crank type design that you guys have had since 1948, believe it or not. Yep. So, I mean, literally you can go on, you know, Alibaba and, or Walmart or Home Depot and you see some of those, you know, $150 grills are using the, the, the crank type, whether it's, you know, manual just or a real crank. 
just like you guys have to adjust that uh, charcoal box. Yeah, Brinkman and Master Build and Charbroil over uh, over the last probably 15 years have brought in a little bit. Now you'll notice on those models, you get about four or five inches of play on your crank. You know, so it's really, it's a small charcoal box and they just want to kind of give you the ability to, if you're running your coals too hot, be able to get them away. Um, uh, another company, M Grills, came out a couple of years ago with basically the same thing that we've been doing for 50 years, where you have a lot of travel. Um, we have essentially, depending on the model, 14 to 18 inches of travel on it. So it really allows you to get an inch and a half underneath a stake and basically almost get caveman style uh, of searing something to be able to drop it all the way down and do a really slow cook. Um, and you'll notice on some of those things you've shown on the website, we do have a heat diffuser that you can put over your charcoal. So you can truly get an offset style cooking in that model because you can shield your meat from your fire uh, and move that fire in it, you know, down in the, uh, the opposite direction of your food uh, and get basically the same effect you would get in a big offset cooker. You're, you're getting no direct heat at all and it's all just hot smoking convection air. So with the different models, the Suburban, I guess, is the smaller model, more of like a starter, but they all pretty much have the same features as far as the adjustability of the charcoal, um, the, the way the internals are set up with the ash, uh, ash pan and the charcoal basket and the heat deflector, the front shelf, the hood, um, except for the gourmet that's got a little bit taller, but they all pretty much have the same, pretty much the same features. So you could start out with you know, a, a smaller suburban, you know, under the thousand dollars and, and have the same type of features you have in a, in a more expensive of, of along the same line, correct? Absolutely. Yeah. The sacrifice you make on, uh, and most of it is just the amount of cook room you have. Now our portable, uh, our portable series, if you will, which is basically uh, our newly released Nomad, which we can talk about here in a little bit, and our Ranger, uh, those are a little different. The Nomad uh, has a, uh, the firebox is not adjustable per se. Now you can pull it out and raise it in, uh, hook it on basically a different slide in spot and move it a little bit closer. Um, I think three or four, yeah, right there. So that firebox that's on the bottom, you can pull that top heat shield out and manually move that firebox up if you want a hotter sear. Uh, the Ranger does have the adjustability uh, on that model, uh, but it, it's chain driven. Now I actually really like the chain driven uh, idea. It, it does allow you to move your firebox up and down. You see that little ball on the left, you lift that chain and the firebox moves. Uh, but as soon as you get away from those portable models, yes, it's a crank model all the way up. And it really just kind of depends on how much space you need. Now, I'll tell you a little secret on my end, which probably makes me the worst sales guy in the world. Uh, I have probably 75% of the models we have. I cook on that Ranger 80% of the time and I have a family of four. Uh, and it's not that that Ranger is so huge, it's that it's the perfect size for the standard weeknight grilling. So you can go throw some burgers, throw some dogs, throw some chicken thighs or chicken breasts on, uh, and it uses a about half the size or half the amount of charcoal that a lot of the other models do. It lights up in about half the amount of time. So I keep that thing on a little cart right by my back door and if we just want to do a quick weeknight grill, that ranger gets used all the time. Now, if I'm going to go smoke a brisket or a pork butt or some ribs or, um, you know, a pork loin or something like that, I'll go and I'll fire up one of my bigger models. But uh, I, I love that ranger. It's probably my favorite grill that we make uh, at the $7.49 price point uh, just because it, it's unbelievably versatile. And it only weighs 48 pounds. So I will take it off that cart and I'll throw it in the back of my truck and we'll take it down to the lake or down to the river. Uh, out to a cabin for the weekend and put it on the back porch and I don't have to worry about that horrible $29, uh, you know, VRBO grill that, that's at every single uh, rental place you've ever been to because I bring my own grill and I can smoke on that Ranger all day long. It's got a heat shield. It's got an adjustable firebox. So we'll cook ribs. We'll cook a prime rib or, uh, or pork loin or something for the weekend and I can do it all on that little Ranger. Now they also have some, uh, the Hastings is a lot bigger grill and they also have some built-ins as well. So if you're building a custom kitchen um, where, you know, we have a lot of, you know, Florida people grill here year round. So building custom kitchens and these new homes is very big around here. So um, those, those um, actually look pretty decent as well. The Hastings looks like it's got a double charcoal box. Is that correct? Yeah. So if roundabout justified is the Hastings is just the equivalent of two gourmets or two legacies side by side. It has two fire boxes. 
uh, two access doors. Uh, when you're to open the thing up, it's the equivalent of, of literally two of those drills. So it's a great party grill. If you have a, a you know, backyard that you love to entertain in and you cook for a lot of people, uh, that's kind of the grill you want. We have a cart model and we have a built-in model of that. It, and it's literally the, the, the built-in model is sat on a cart. So it's the same exact grill. Uh, it vents out the sides, uh, which is a little different vending system, but it's still below the great level. Uh, so we have a lot of people that love that if they just love entertaining in their backyard. The Fiesta model is essentially the gourmet that's a built-in. So we take the bottom part of it off uh, and it, the firebox is on the front, the crank's on the front, you know, as opposed to the side. Uh, so it's good for a built-in. It vents out the back like our, uh, uh, like everything else kind of does, but that's a gourmet top is what it is. So you can run your rotisserie on it uh, and, and just like that. So it's a great, and it's got a trim kit that comes with it as well. So it works really good for built-in. Uh, has a really clean, pretty sleek look design to it. Uh, and people who love Hasty Bake, but they don't want to be wheeling it around their backyard or worried about spilling grease or anything like that. They just want to kind of sit and forget that those are the built-ins they lean to. Yeah. Let's get back into the uh, the new Nomad that you guys just came out with because you are in a partnership with the SCA, the State Cook-Off Association. And um, these are getting very popular now. You know, PKs have kind of ruled that... Um, uh, competition circuit for a while because you know just the design of them and you know they're easy to lug around and how close they get to the charcoal but now the uh, you guys have found that the hasty bake is, is picking up speed as far as that goes as well correct yeah so uh, I started cooking SCA back when they kind of first started uh, was never as heavy of a competition guy uh, in SCA as a lot of these guys were but there was always a big draw to the SCA for me and part of it was uh, it was a lot easier weekend. It was a lot cheaper weekend. Uh, frankly, I had more fun with it because I cooked for a couple hours and drank beer for five or six hours and hung out with my friends. And that was kind of the, uh, the draw to it. But on the SCA trail, PK kind of ruled the roost. And the reason being was it was an approachable price point. Uh, and it was a bucket you put fire in. And you could dump that bucket out and throw it in the back of your truck and walk away. Uh, and I think that's kind of, you know, why it became so popular. But what we've noticed, uh, similar to kind of the, the progression of KCBS, is that as SCA gets more and more competitive, uh, guys are wanting their grills to do more and more. It's no longer just about cooking a steak correctly. It's about getting the right grill marks and getting the right color and maintaining the right moisture and, and, all, and all the stuff that kind of goes into it. And you need a more versatile grill at that point than just a bucket you can put fire into. So uh, we, we've become a marketing partner with the SCA this last year. Uh, just reached out to them and said, we love what you're doing. We want to be involved. So we started marketing with them. Uh, and at that time, I reached out uh, probably February of this year uh, to uh, six different cook teams that I knew in the SCA that we respected that were doing really well in the points chase, uh, along with uh, Ken Phillips and Brett Galloway, founders of the SCA. Uh, and we said, hey, if we were to design the perfect grill, what would it look like? Uh, what, what does everyone care about? And they, you know, they mentioned things like, the dual zone cooking and the fire distance and the ability to be, you know, get convective smoke and all that kind of stuff. And we sat down and we said, okay, we have a model that at the time we called the portable and we thought it was kind of the good skeleton for what we wanted to do, but we needed to make the portable bigger. Uh, we needed to add some heat shielding to it. We needed to add some different handles and some different ability to be able to hold some hotter heat in it. So we re-engineered and redesigned our portable grill. Uh, and then we, you know, started getting, feedback from all these guys and they said we like this and we don't like that and we want to tweak this and we just went back and forth and essentially let these guys who've been cooking SCA for a long long time uh, let them design their perfect grill and took all the feedback from it and what you're seeing right now is the is the fruit of that labor and that's the nomad so it's uh, we launched pre-sale on the 24th of last month uh, we've sold several hundred units we're very excited about it I think people are uh, can't wait we've had uh, over a dozen units sold outside of the United States. Guys are clamoring and saying, hey, we got to figure out a way to get this thing to Norway and to Holland and to Australia and, uh, you know, all the other places that SCA has gotten real big into. Uh, and they're just, they're going gangbusters over it. So the long and the short of it is you have a very effective two-zone cooking on the Nomad that you can get, you know, 550, 650, 700 if you wanted degree heat on a sear side and maintain a nice 350 or 400 bake on the opposite side. We're shipping every single one of the SCA models. We have two models. Uh, one of them has an SCA badge on it. It comes equipped with grill grates, which if you're cooking in the SCA, you don't have an option. You gotta have some grill grates. <laughs> uh, 
uh, and it's got an extender over to the side that allows you to elevate your steak and kind of get it baked on the side. And then if you like the format, if you like the size of this thing, but you're saying, man, I'm never going to cook a steak on it. Uh, I want to take it down to the lake and I want to burn some hot dogs on the weekend, or I want to take it fly fishing or something with me. We'll sell you that model. We rip the grill grates and the extender out of it. We slap the good old hasty bake logo on it. You save about 25 bucks. Uh, realistically, it's a lot better deal for you to buy the other one because you're going to get about $100 worth of product for $25. But uh, we wanted to give the option for people who wanted to lighten the weight or, or something like that. Yeah, the grill grates alone, I know, is worth more than 25 bucks because they're expensive. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're they, getting about 50 or $60 worth of grill grates and about a $60 extender uh, thrown in for that, that $25 difference. Yeah, and that's, uh, that's, that, that is a nice looking unit. It looks like a toolbox. I mean, it's, um, yep. and it's, but it, you can carry it around. It looks a lot better than a, you know, a PK grill, that's for sure. And a lot more portable. I mean, even though, you know, the, you can wheel a, a PK grill around, um, this looks like it's something that's going to work a lot better. And it's easier, like you said, to throw in your truck to take out to, uh, you know, tailgating to the, you know, the cabin up in the woods or out, you know, picnic or what have you just to, you know, throw some steaks on or what have you. But, um, I think that's also going to get you noticed more outside of the Oklahoma area because I literally, you know, the design of the grill and then, like I said, to know that it's been around since 1948 and it's not as pop, you know, as popular as I think it should be. I mean, being just the only grill company that's been around since 1948, that's still hundred percent made in America to me, it, it means something. And that, you know, even though it is a little bit pricier than, you know, some of the other grills out there, it's going to last forever. And that's always been my, you know, my thoughts is, you know, I, I have a Kamado grill, I have a ceramic grill and, you know, they're expensive as well, but you know, they're going to last a long time unless you drop it. But here's the yeah. thing with this one. If you drop this one, it's not going to break. <laughs> so yeah, you, you don't look at it wrong and it's not going to crack. Yeah. Uh, it, it's, it's amazing. Uh, especially when, depending on the finish on it, even the powder coat, if you take care of that powder coat grill, um, that thing is going to last you forever. And what's funny is, you know, we always build stainless as lasting forever. And it does, you know, as long as you keep that thing clean, rust isn't going to eat away at it. Um, parts are going to maintain. I mean, that grill will outlive you and probably outlive your kids, you know, as long as they just don't get a wild hair and want to buy a new grill. Uh, but you would think the powder coat ones, you know, would eventually rust away. And, but we see more 50, 65, 70 year old hasty bakes. Uh, than you would ever imagine and they're all powder coat because back then they didn't make stainless you know for the first 10 or 15 years of the of the um, company it was all you know carbon steel painted is what it was uh, but we have so many people I, I bet you no exaggeration I get 10 to 15 phone calls a week from someone and it, they all start out the exact same way it's become a joke in the office someone gets on the phone and they say hey so I've got this old hasty bake uh, and then you follow the line of okay how old is it and uh, you know, most companies, you know, an old grill would be five or six or eight years old. Uh, and in our line of work, it's, well, it's, you know, 48 years old. Uh, <laughs> and then, you know, it proceeds, hey, tell me about it. What does it look like? What conditions it in? And they want to know, hey, can I still get a grill for it? Or can I still get a firebox for it? Or, and truthfully, for probably about 60 or 70% of our line, our current parts will fit a lot of those models. Uh, so, I mean, you, you got to buy the part, but a part that lasted you 45 years, I think you're willing to buy again. Uh, so a lot of people are refurbishing grandpa's old grill and they love having that thing on their back porch. Uh, and it's got, you know, 45 years of rib seasoning on it. Uh, and it's the pride of their, of their cooking collection is having that old grill. So, um, there's something to be said for it. And, you know, like you said, there's a lot of grills these days that they look really nice and they can probably cook really good, but you look at them wrong, you knock them wrong, you move them around the back porch, you know, you're going to end up breaking them or breaking apart. Uh, and these things are, you know, rugged as they get. They're, they're solid steel and they're not going anywhere. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm big on, you know, the Kamado uh, cooking. I like, you know, Kamado Joe. And I just, I'm in a lot of the Facebook groups and I, I saw somebody the other day, they bought, you know, one of the new Kamado Joe uh, 3, Classic 3, which has an insert in it and it's bigger and all that. But it's, you know, almost a $3,000 ceramic grill. And the guy moved and the movers dropped it and smashed it. Like, you know, and you know, that's just what happens. Yeah. It'll last forever. Yeah. It just sits there and doesn't move, you know? Yeah. It could probably right. last you a long time, but you know, even with those, you know, the, the, after a while, the, uh, 
the uh, firebox will crack or you know something's going to happen to it eventually the bands are loose and the top fall i've seen it happen i've seen it a lot of times where you know they are fragile things you have ceramic but you know that thing can smash really easy but you well, there's those. things you got to move around on them too. You know, your heat oh, yeah. diffuser plates for the most part is ceramic and those can get broken and, and you got to pull those out if you want to be able to, you know, truly tend your fire. All we have a, we have a full width fire door on the side of ours that you can go in there and add coal or mess around, throw some wood in, move some things around all you want. Your meat stays locked inside smoking in that chamber all while you're doing it. Uh, you got to pull all that stuff out, but every time you do it, you got to store it. You got to be worried about breaking it. Yeah. Um, and, and I'll, I'll be the first one to say, you're never going to have a dry meal on a Kamado cooker. Uh, they, they cook a phenomenally moist, uh, really juicy meal. Uh, but there's downsides to every cooker and then the fragility, fragility, whatever, whatever that word is, uh, of a, of a Kamado cooker is probably one of their biggest downsides. But, but like you said too, you gotta, if you want to add more smoking wood, you got to pull everything out to throw it in there. Yeah. You don't have to do that with the hasty bake. Like I said, I'm, I'm a big, you know, a Kamado fan but I can see where the hasty bake has a couple legs up on it, you know? Yeah. Uh, so I have both of them now on my patio and I'm going to do some, you know, comparison cooking. Um, but you know, they both are convection type cookers. They're both versatile. Um, they both, like I said, you know, are going to have their uh, strengths and weaknesses against each other, but both of them are going to last for a long time. So to be in the same price range, you know, somebody will drop a thousand bucks on a, a big green egg, no problem, but then they'll, you know, look at this and go, Oh, that's a thousand bucks. Well, I tell you what, it's going to last you just as long, you know, yeah. if not longer than a big green egg because it, uh, you know, it's, you don't have that whole, you know, like knock it over and it's going to, you know, break in, in a thousand different pieces for sure. Well, you know, we, we don't bat an eye when we spend 35, $40,000 on a vehicle and we keep that vehicle for five or 10 years. Uh, and you know, you drive it to work in the morning and you drive it home. Uh, but when you look at how often you grill and how often you cook outside, especially for the people who enjoy that hobby a lot, you know, you're cooking five, six, seven, eight times a week on that grill. Uh, and a lot of these grills are going to last you 30, 40 years. Uh, your, your cost of ownership goes down dramatically when you, you know, you spend that kind of money on something quality and it lasts you that long. Yeah. If you go into Home Depot, Walmart and all these other grills, like I said, that, you know, Royal Gourmet or Char Griller, Char Broil um, that are pretty much cheap Chinese Alibaba grills, they're not meant to last you a long time. They're meant to rust out after a couple of years. So you go buy another one. That's why they're so yeah, cheap. It's a, two -year, it's a two year grill if you're lucky. Yeah. If you're lucky. I mean, I've seen it. I mean, I started out with, you know, the cheaper gra gas grills, you know, back in, you know, how long do they last? All the, the guts rust out of them, like in the first year, especially here in Florida, because it's so humid all the time. Yeah. I mean, we go through, I used to go through, you know, grills and smokers every two or three years you're getting a new one and um all the money i wasted over the years and i look at you know hey i could have got something of a higher quality and not have to worry about it you know and then pass it down to my family like you said <laughs> but yeah, absolutely uh, but sometimes you know people get that stuck in their head they just see the initial cost and then they don't figure that you know in two years you're going to have to get a new one i will never spend any money on another gas grill i don't prefer cooking on gas and it's literally you know, you have to replace them, you know, you have to, if not just the grill, but the guts, which cost you another 70, 80, a hundred bucks just to get the, yeah. uh, the burners and stuff. And it doesn't make sense to me. And I don't like cooking on propane anyway. Well, you know, we, we have a retail store here that is not just selling hasty bakes. You know, we sell, uh, other grills as well. Um, hasty bakes, the only charcoal grill truly that we sell. And we have, you know, we sell Yoder and we sell Weber. Uh, but if, if you're in the, you know, in the market for a gas grill to get a quality gas grill, you're probably talking about dropping $1,500 and then up, you know, up till 10 or 15 grand, if you will. Uh, so even when you're going to Home Depot and you're buying that six or $700 grill and you, you know, you think at that point, this is a big investment. Uh, it, it's not a grill that's made to last you, you know, then let, until you start spending that $1,500, $2,000 uh, gas grill, that's the grill that's going to, you know, you're probably going to get 10 or 15 years out of. Uh, and, and propane is very corrosive and everything else. And they're just, I mean, like you said, I mean, you couldn't say it better. Those grills are made to get you until you buy the next one. And they, right. it's a continual thing. And, you know, probably one of the detriment and one of the jokes inside here is, uh, you know, as we're making tweaks and redesigning stuff and even designing this nomad is, you know, somebody will say, Hey, we want to put this on it. Uh, and, and one of the jokes is like, 
well, if that thing's not going to wear out for 30 years, how am I going to sell them another grill? Uh, but it's just that our, we're bent to go the way of we want this thing to last forever. Uh, and, and it's just not that way, you know, with a lot of other companies. Right. So you guys do have the, the, the store there, you said, and, um, yeah. And you have dealers as well that sell your, your grills and you do sell on Amazon and you sell through your website. How big is your dealer network? We try to keep it pretty close to home. Uh, so we got about 30 dealers nationwide, uh, truthfully, probably five to 10 that are, uh, you know, very effective dealers. And truly the most effective dealer is somebody who cooks on the grill. They enjoy the grill. Maybe they have one in their own backyard. Their employees enjoy cooking on it. Uh, cause once you cook on it, that you, it's it, that selling point's almost moot at that point. You, you, it's really easy to talk about. You love it. You love all the features of it. Uh, so we probably have five or 10 dealers around the country that have taken to that point where they're just in love with it. And another, you know, 20 to 25 that, uh, carry it and sell it occasionally in a lot of outdoor kitchens and stuff like that. Uh, like you said, we are on Amazon. We are on barbecue guys. You have to be these days. It's just, you know what it is. Uh, the majority of our model is a direct to consumer model. So we sell uh, 85% of our grills. Um, maybe that's a lie. We probably sell 70% of our grills online and 20% in our store. And then, you know, the other to the dealers. Uh, but our, we, we encourage people to buy them from our website. Obviously we make a little bit more money when you buy them from us than, you know, through, uh, through a dealer, but we do ship for free. Uh, which is not, you know, always the case depending on where you go. Um, so if you're if you're in the market, direct to consumer is kind of the way we we try to push you. But we do have Amazon and Barbecue guys. We know people respect those companies. They like their, uh, you know, their kind of guaranteed assurance on things. They trust the reviews on them. Uh, they are good partners of ours. Barbecue guys, especially, they're great folks over there. Uh, but but we do sell them on our own website and we do ship them for free. So uh, you don't have to worry about uh, that aspect of it, which. You know, shipping a grill that size, you know, costs you 150, you know, almost 200 bucks, and and that's oh, yeah. something not a lot of people count on when they when they go to buy it from a different vendor or an Alibaba or something like that. Like your shipping cost is a lot when when you ship a 200 dollar or 200 pound item on a pallet across the country. It's not a cheap endeavor. No, and yeah, and just the packing. You know, I, I, when I got mine came the other day, I was just amazed how easy this thing was to put together. I mean, that you know, <laughs> I, I took it out of the box it looked like a mummy because it had the you know insulation and the plastic all wrapped up around it but when i got all that off i was like goodness gracious this thing is 85 to 90 percent put together already you know i really just had to put the handles on and put the grates in the in spots you know and that was about it yep. i mean it was really so you know so simple and easy to put together and you could just tell how well made it was from that and there was no way, unless they actually dropped this thing off the back of a lift, um, th there was nothing that was going to really hurt it at all. And um, well, I'll it, tell you, FedEx can figure out ways to hurt grills. Yeah, I'll be the first oh, one to admit that. I had, uh, I, had one, if, I had one like that too from FedEx, but um, but still, if I mean, it can be broke, uh, FedEx should do the torture testing for any company because if it can be broke, FedEx will figure out a way to break it. Yeah, uh, but but I mean that's that's true, man. When we when we pack stuff it's a really big concern of ours to make sure that the customer is not highly inconvenienced when they get it. I remember about 10 years ago, uh, I, I was in the market for a new gas grill and I decided, I, you know, I don't use it very often, but I want something semi-decent quality. So I decided to buy a, a high-end Weber grill, uh, probably spent about a thousand dollars on it, was very excited to get it. And, uh, and it took me four and a half hours to put together. And I had saw horses out and was trying to balance stuff on the back of my truck and everything was heavy and it had a million different screws. Uh, and the last thing I wanted to do when I got that last screw in was cook on that thing. I just wanted to cuss it and kick <laughs> it in the garage and, and think about it, you know, a week later. And I was all excited when it got delivered. Uh, I, we don't want that for our customers. We want it to, you know, we tell people all the time, they say, well, how much assembly? And I said, from the time I drop that off to the time you throw your first steaks on is going to be about 40 minutes. And truthfully, it's about 10 or 15 minutes of them putting that thing together. Uh, and then 15 minutes to heat your coals up. I think the, the, it, literally the, the thing that took the most time was pulling the film off of the uh, stainless steel stuff, <laughs> you know, because that stuff was kind of hard to get off, but that's it. I mean, I mean, that's all I was doing. We were pulling the, the, the film, the protective uh, coating on the stainless steel, but everything else was just like, boom, boom. I had one screwdriver, a Phillips head screwdriver and a, you know, pair of pliers and it was done, you know, within, you know, 15, 20 minutes. 
and most of that time was pulling that film off of there. <laughs> but um, yeah, and if we could ship it without the film, we would. But even cardboard scratches stainless if you you know rub it on a freight truck for 400 miles. So yeah, uh, it's kind of one of the costs of doing business. Oh, I'm not complaining. It was uh, you know why it's yeah. there, but that, like I said, that's the the most uh, really that you have to do. Um, and I've seen even these. Uh, a lot of these stuff that comes from China, like the new master built that's been, everybody's been, you know, Ooh, the master built, you know, gravity fed, it's still a cheap grill and it still comes from China and the instructions aren't that good. I've known a couple of friends of mine that bought them and it took them almost two and a half hours to put the thing together and they cut themselves. They, you know, had to redo things three or four times. The parts don't fit right together. <laughs> so I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a funny story about that master built. Uh, I'm a grill head, right? So anything that new that comes out, I kind of want to play around with. So I said, you know, I'm going to drop the money and buy this master built uh, just because I want to see how it works. It's, I love the concept of a, a gravity fed charcoal grill. Uh, and I, there's companies out there, you know, like the stumps of the world that have always done it very, very well. Uh, but they haven't really incorporated a lot of electronics to it. So I thought I'm going to, I'm going to blow the, you know, 400 bucks or whatever it is. Uh, and I had a buddy of mine who's one of our assemblers. Uh, and I said, hey, man, will you do me a favor? Like, you're so quick at assembling stuff. Can you put this thing together for me? He said, no problem. Uh, four hours. <laughs> yeah. And uh, two of those hours was him uh, with equipment that the normal homeowner would not have, trying to bend out the, the bent and broken pieces of metal because the packaging on that grill was so bad. So he essentially had to refab that grill before he could even put it down because none of the legs were lined up and, and everything was off. Uh, and again, bad taste in my mouth. I didn't even want to fire the thing up because it took someone who was a professional assembler that long to build it. <laughs> yeah. And that's another thing, you know, those things, you know, they're all a rage right now, but they're only like six months old when they start breaking, you know, I've already got, I, I watched the, all the Facebook groups, you know, I, I'm in a lot of them just to watch a lot of these, you know, the, yep. the uh, brand ones. And I watched them, you know, when they first came out, Oh, this is great. It's the best thing ever. And then all of a sudden, Oh, now the uh, the firebox is starting to warp, and there's things happening. And uh, now that the all of a sudden my uh, electronics aren't working anymore, the fans stop working. I mean, that's the kind of things you're going to run into when you're buying something strictly on price. You know, right? And that's um, I had I had the guys on from Master Built. I had the Macklemores on, and, and they're the first to say that they they wanted it at 500 bucks. They wanted it to somebody they could send it to the mass markets and, and sell it at the uh, home depots and stuff in Walmart cheap. And so right. everything's done cheap. Everything's done cheap in China and you know, it's not built to last at all. And I, you know, okay, you can buy it. I, I, that's just not me. I want something that's going to be out there and I, I know I don't have to, you know, have an issue. I got, I start a cook and all of a sudden the electronics go on it, you know, or the fan shut. Well, when you depend on that, you know, that's one of the things, and I know you're a charcoal guy and me being, you know, charcoal guy too. One of our pride points is uh, there's nothing on this thing that can break that'll keep me from being able to use it. Right. You know, it, it, anything that it's got a plug on it, there's a liability there. You know, it's kind of like when you buy that new fancy car and it's got all the nice computer things. And uh, at some point, something's going to go out and it's going to be hot and you can't get your windows down or whatever it is. Uh, on that charcoal grill, man, it, it's a box that you put hot coals into. And as long as you got hot coals and, uh, and something to grill, like you're going to be able to use that grill. Exactly. And in Florida, you know, we have hurricanes, we have thunderstorms, we, the power goes out, you know, multiple times a year. Um, I have a, I have a pellet grill. I got a camp chef pellet grill and I like using it every once in a while, but that's not something that you can rely on, you know, cause the power goes out for, you know, a few days, you know, I can cook out. I got four other cookers that take charcoal out there. I can cook on, you know, yep, and, uh, absolutely. I don't have to worry about, you know, the uh, only way I got to cook is with, you know, something with a fan on it, you know, electronics and all that. So, but definitely. Yep, absolutely. Well, all right, uh, Nick, I want to, you know, thank you for being on. I'm going to make sure that everybody has the hasty bake uh, website in the link below. Make sure you check them out. You can check them out on Amazon, check them out on their website barbecue uh guys also and dot com but um I, I really love the way like i said this this thing looks like it's it was designed recently and i just can't believe it's been around since 1948 made in the usa um quality quality product um i know it's going to get with all the uh especially what's going on now with the <laughs> the covid people are cooking at home a lot more 
people are buying grills. They're looking for high quality grills. I mean, you know, the, um, even the, you know, the Kamado grills are starting to really sell a lot more. People are looking for higher end grills. You're always going to have people looking at the cheap grills at the, at the Walmart and Home Depot. But I think nowadays people are looking for something that's going to last and something that like this is it's adjustable. Um, I know that Nomad's going to, you guys are going to have a hard time keeping that thing in stock because that's another one that, sure. uh, that's going to, you know, the, the ACA is going to help you guys overall sell more grills. What's the production that you guys can do out of your, out of your um, uh, warehouse there? How many, how many grills can you build a, a week out of there? That's one of the things I wanted to ask you earlier. So, you know, it depends on the model because, you know, that full line, but uh, we build somewhere between 1,500 and 2,000 grills a year. Uh, so it's not, you know, it, we have some of the most advanced equipment. I mean, I'll tell you, uh, we have three lasers on the back and two of them uh, are the same laser they cut the uh, International Space Station with. Uh, so we, we have some very, very high end equipment out there. Grills are not the only thing we build. We have a full fabrication facility uh, that we, you know, have another side of our business that does all that. Uh, but the capacity we normally pump out, you know, sub 2000 grills a year. Uh, and that's because we want to be able to limit that control and make sure that we're, we're doing them right. Uh, you know, we could probably simplify the design a lot and cheapen up the grills and use cheaper components and pump out a lot more. But when you're, uh, as you know, you just from putting the grill together, uh, the assembly time on that grill uh, on our end uh, is hours for the 15 minutes for you to, to build it in. So uh, we want to make sure we're doing it right. So we kind of keep it, um, you know, as we go as fast as we can, but at the end of the day, we're not willing to sacrifice anything on it. Well, I, for one, I'm appreciative of the, all the work that you put in assembling that thing, because literally, I mean, that was my, me and my son, and my son was down visiting me, my older son, and uh, we were like, really, this thing is together already, <laughs> you know, because we were expecting it to be, you know, an hour and a half or two hours, but literally everything was just, you know, screw here, screw here, you know, pull this stuff off, and, and we're up and cooking, so I mean, it's just it's a great product. Uh, I'm look forward to, you know, cooking on it and doing some videos and uh, working with you guys too. So, but thanks for uh, being on. I'll probably have you on again sometime soon. Cause I want to talk about some of the events that you guys do and sponsor. Uh, I know that you can yeah. have a annual um, competition at the hasty bake headquarters, correct? Yeah, that's correct. So it's kind of similar to like what an egg fest would be for, for you Kamado guys. Um, we have uh, owners from all over the country kind of descend. This year, we, we normally do it in May. We bumped it to September. Truthfully, we're probably going to end up having to bump it again, you know, with all the COVID stuff. But, uh, but people from all over the country fly in and descend on uh, what we call the mothership, the, the headquarters in Tulsa. And we set up, uh, you know, 150 tents outside and have teams come in and uh, just have a, a nice, friendly competition of, you know, backyard cooks with a couple of different categories and people sharing recipes and the public comes in and uh, it's a good old time. So keep, if anybody's interested, keep your eye out for that. Like I said, we may end up having to bump it again as everybody else is bumping their stuff, but it's something we do every year. It's probably our favorite day of the year. And I will mention too, we, uh, for anybody who's looking at our price point, they're like, man, I love it, but I'm not quite there yet. Uh, in September of, of just about every year, we do a scratch and dent sale. Uh, so this year it's September 3rd through the 5th, which is Labor Day, the Thursday through Friday, or Saturday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, uh, before Labor Day. Uh, and a lot of those grills are 20 to 30% off. Now we can, we can ship them to you. You pay the shipping in that case because uh, the discount's so deep. Uh, but you'll end up saving, you know, several hundred dollars on one of those grills uh, if you don't mind a little scratch and dent on it. And we're pretty, we're pretty strict with our models when we send them out. If anything looks weird, we mark it as a number two and we save it for scratch and dent. So there's a lot of stuff times, you, you know, you'll, you'll walk up on a grill at our scratch and dent sale and you won't even be able to tell what's wrong with that grill. And it's, you know, some little powder coat nick in the back or something. Uh, so keep your eye out for that. We, it's local, but we also can take phone orders for it. And uh, you can get yourself into a hasty bake for, you know, 25% off, which is uh, always a nice little advantage. Is there any way we could get a list of what's available on that online or do we have to call? Well, truthfully, we don't know until about two weeks before because that's when we start pulling them out and making sure everything's kind of ready to go. But if you call, you know, uh, Monday or so of that week, we'll let you know how many of each we have. We're normally pretty loaded up. Uh, you know, we'll have several hundred uh, grills, you know, depending on different sizes. And a lot of times they end up, you know, kind of building almost a, you know, we'll, we'll take a perfectly good box have a little chip in the hood and they'll put that hood on it. So, uh, you know, we, we don't know what we have until we kind of get a little bit closer. But the only thing, uh, the 357s are a little slim. That's our big, 
not the not the big backyard model, but kind of our big insulated, very fancy model. They're a little slim on that, and our rangers normally go in the first two hours because everyone's clamoring for those. But uh, even if you came in on Friday or Saturday, you get yourself into a legacy or a gourmet, no problem. I'm looking at the ranger. So, <laughs> uh, g- give, give me a call nine oh one on that Thursday morning. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yeah, because those that like you said that that one looks like it's a perfect size for you know, the weekday cook or even just throwing in the back of your, you know, car and taking it wherever you want to. It's kind of in between, yep. uh, you know, the, the, the Nomad looks good too, but I'm, but you can do a little bit more, I think, with that Ranger than you can the Nomad. Absolutely. So, yep. all right. Well, thanks for being on. Is there anything else you want to talk about? Anything else coming up with the Hasty Bake that you want to talk about before I let you go? No, just keep your eyes. Uh, that Nomad is still on pre-sale, so keep your eyes open this Sunday night. At uh, eleven fifty nine is when we're shutting the pre sale down on the Nomad. The price is going to jump about fifty bucks. So if you're interested on it, uh, save yourself a little money and get that now. We're going to ship those grills out starting at the end of this month. Uh, but other than that, man, I appreciate you having us on. I'm excited to see the stuff you're pumping out on on your gourmet, uh, and let's just keep in touch on it. It's a uh, it'll be a fun time. Definitely. Um, I really, like I said, I had two cooks on it. I did. Uh... And the first one was I just seared up some steaks and then I did the brisket and beans on it yesterday for my son's uh, 19th birthday, which turned out great. And I actually, since it's the gourmet, it's got that glass window. I used uh, the LA's totally awesome stuff, took the uh, smoke right off the window really quick. So, <laughs> Hey, if you, if you keep up on it, you can keep that window clean. You get 30 cooks on it. You're going to be scrubbing that thing for a little while. <laughs> yeah, that's what I figured. So I figured as soon as I'm done with it, it cools off. I'm going to clean that thing off, but um, it's yep. definitely um, really a great machine so far. I mean, I, I mean, I love it. Um, so I'm going to piddle around with it. I got a ultra Q coming that I'm going to see if I can install that and play around and see if it uh, helps with uh, keeping the, keeping it going for a longer time but uh thanks again for being on i can't wait to uh do some more cooks on it and have you on again someday absolutely thanks appreciate it all right buddy i'll see you on the next one well i want to thank nick parsons again from hasty bake for being on i want to thank you guys for listening make sure you check out hasty bake grills hastybake.com you can check out the links below you can also check out the links below below for their facebook page and facebook group Thanks for following along on the Fire and Water Cooking Podcast. Make sure you check us out on our Facebook group and page as well. And also check out the Fire and Water Cooking YouTube channel. And I'll see you again on the next Fire and Water Cooking Podcast.